So I'm, I'm going to talk about basically four areas. Um, I'm not going to read this to you. I don't like to read slides to folks if I can help it. Um, but basically, we're going to talk about the basics of physician painting. So that's kind of important to understanding why we have SGR in the first place. And we're going to also talk about some of the consequences of what's happened since SGR has been in place. And then sort of what the future is going to be. Um, so uh, Medicare uh, pays physicians very differently than all the payment systems that Jim Matthews just described to you. Most of those payment systems, they're all fee-for-service in, in many ways, but they're not really paid the same way. Um, and Medicare, there is a physician fee schedule, which means that basically Medicare pays for every single service. So if you're a physician and you're trimming fingernails, you can get paid for that. You can get paid for everything. It's much more simple than, than these other systems that are made up of bundles of services or based on the patient condition um, as well as other things. The other sort of simple thing about um, the fee schedule is it's mostly multiplication and math, <laughs> not a lot of other complicated, complicated, complicated ways of paying. Um, uh, the fee schedule is based on what they call a resource-based relative value scale, which means um, that each service is valued relative to um, a, a typical service. Um, in this case, it's um, what we call a mid-level office visit. And it, it, it's to account for the resources that t it takes to perform that service. So obviously trimming fingernails, that's not a service that requires a lot of resources. But doing brain surgery, in this case, when people always say it's not brain surgery, this is brain surgery, when it's brain surgery, it, it does require a lot of resources. Um, there's over 7,000 services that are covered, um, including office visits, uh, surgical procedures, and tests. Um, and in this system, uh, Medicare pays 80% 80, uh, 80 um, of the, for the service, and the beneficiary typically pays 20%, which you heard about earlier. Um, Non-physician providers also um, are paid under the fee schedule. This includes nurse practitioners and physician assistants and physical therapists and psychologists. Um, they're also paid under this fee schedule. Um, we ended up with a fee schedule, just to say a few more things here, um, because the previous system uh, basically resulted in wide um, variation in fees, which gave us a rapid rise in Medicare spending, which we're going to see a little later. The payments didn't reflect the resources, and there was, you know, a lot of differences, disparities among the specialties in terms of what they were paid. So two, two different specialists could be paid very differently for the same service. Um, and I'll see one more thing here. The RBRVS, basically how it was created was there was a pretty comprehensive Harvard study of physicians. Um, and the physi they had physicians sit down and take a look at everything that they do and sort of come up with what those resources would be. Um, okay. So this is kind of an oversimplification of the payment formula, but basically there's three components. There's the relative value unit. Um, these payments are also adjusted for geography, meaning there's geographic differences uh, in the way, um, in, in the amount of uh, resources required. Uh, so therefore, you know, in New York City it might be more expensive to have a, to operate a practice versus uh, in West Virginia. And then there's a conversion factor, which is um, basically a dollar amount that, that converts the RVUs and the geographic adjustment into a payment amount. Um, and that's where the SGR formula actually comes in. Um, Skipping ahead, so I, t I talked a little bit about this, but the, under the RBRVS, um, it's relative to other services, and the weights are made up of three things. The physician work, so the time and skill and training involved, uh, the practice expense, the rents, utilities, equipment, supplies, the staff, and malpractice expense. Now people like to call this professional liability. They don't like the label malpractice anymore, so just remember that if you're ever talking to physicians, they prefer to hear professional liability. Um, so, as I mentioned, it's the relative complexity is compared to a benchmark service, which is a mid-level office visit. So if, for example, the mid-level office visit is worth, is a, has an RV value of 1, a service with 1.475 RVUs um, would be estimated to be 47.5% more costly to provide than the mid-level office visit. And it could work the other way, too. There are some RVUs that are less than 1. Um, just putting this all together. Uh, these initial values I mentioned, the Harvard study was done in the 80s and 90s, and it was a pretty big endeavor. Can you imagine taking what you do every day and sort of like breaking out into pieces and then sort of figuring out how much, how many resources does it take to write this report or to make this phone call? Um, in addition to collecting information on the work, they also collected information um, from the specialty societies on their practice expense costs. And then they collected information from the yeah. um, major carriers of liability insurance to give them information about the premiums that, that were being paid. 
The RBU system um, does get updated. Uh, there's a, in, in law, it's required to be updated every five years, but it does get updated more frequently than that because new codes come into the system, and so that has to have be, uh, be updated, as well as um, CMS often looks to see if things are being um, misvalued. Um, and this updating is done by the Relative Value Update Committee. You may have heard about the RUC. Um, I don't know how much that comes up right now, but um, the RUC is made up of physicians and it's run by AMA. It's a voluntary sort of effort, but CMS needed a way to update the system because, again, this, this was all developed in the 1980s and over time, obviously, prices change. Um, and some people don't like the RUC because they sort of feel like it's imbalanced. There's a lot of specialists on the RUC. Um, uh, and some people have a, have a problem with that. Some people have a problem with the idea of physicians sort of weighing in that much on how much they're getting paid. Um, they, they regard it as a, sort of the fox guarding the hen house in some ways. Um, in the past, CMS took about 90% of the recommendations that the RUC would make, and now it's, it's much less. And actually, GAO is doing a study on this, top, this very topic. Um, I think it's going to be out sometime in the spring, but it's looking at the RUC process and how, fee, how these fees are updated. Okay, moving on. Um, so the next component, the geographic adjustment, um, this is the best acronym in healthcare, GYPSY. I mean, there's not a better, a I dare anybody to find a better one because I like it. And every time I mention it, my husband makes some reference to, um, to, to somebody, some comedian. But anyway, <laughs> he always says, don't curse me, GYPSY, but I don't know what that means. Um, anyway, <laughs> so I, again, I think this is the best, the best part of physician payment is being able to say the word GYPSY over and over again. But basically, um, this is used, again, to adjust for the, the differences in um, practice costs um, across areas. Um, and they have the same three elements, the physician work, the practice expense, and malpractice. And that's all on the assumption that there is variation in those three things across different areas. And if you read a little more into this, you'll find out that not everybody agrees that there's variation, at least on the physician work side of things. Um, there's 89 areas in this country that are set up for the, the as the geographic area. So that involves um, areas as wide as like an entire state, so Alaska is its own geographic area. Um, and then you have LA. LA is just one city in, in a very large state. And then you have some states where, like Louisiana, where you have New Orleans sort of has its own payment area, and then the rest of Louisiana is the payment area. Um, if a gypsy is equal to one, that's kind of average. If it's less than one, it's, it means that area is less, less expensive. If it's greater than one, it's more expensive. However, um, through a number of uh, years, over a number of years now, we have um, what is called a gypsy floor. Um, and that is basically where everybody gets at least one. <laughs> and some places are, are, are better than that. But there were places previously that were below one and, and places that were obviously way above. Um, so the work gypsy is, is they, they calculate that using a sample of wages from certain specialty professions. Um, the practice expense gypsy uh, reflects, again, the same thing, employee wages and office rents. And the malpractice gypsy reflects malpractice insurance premiums. And these are updated every three years by CMS. Okay, the last piece. So as I said before, the conversion factor, basically what it does is it converts the RVUs and the geographic adjustment into dollar amounts. And SGR is what's used to sort of make that determination about what the conversion factor will be. So just looking at this slide, um, based on what was passed uh, in the <laughs> last Congress, um, from January 1 to March 31st, the conversion factor is going to be $35.75, essentially. But come April 1, um, through the end of the year, at least at this point, um, and this is set on a yearly basis, except for in this particular case, which I'll explain, um, it's, going to, it's going to go down to $28.22. So that's a big cut for physicians to be facing. Um, and the highest it's ever been was $38, but it was 31 in 1992, so it hasn't really been these large amounts over time. Okay, now I'm going to get into some specifics of how you, again, this is the, just the multiplication, basically, of how you calculate a payment, and I want to sort of show you the different pieces. Um, so this is an office visit for an established patient performed by a physician in the D.C. area in a non-facility setting. What we mean by non-facility means it's in a physician's office. Um, so you can see the RVU is... 2.04, and the geographic adjustment is 1.134, and then the conversion factor, we multiply those to get $82.71. Um, just as a caveat, and it's at the bottom, this is a simplification of the payment formula. If you go and look this up on the physician fee schedule lookup, it won't be exactly this amount, but we were trying to simplify this for, for demonstration purposes. 
So doing the same procedure in a facility setting, um, same area, uh, Washington, D.C., you can see that what varies here is the RVU. It's 1.43 instead of 2.04. Um, so when you multiply this out, uh, you basically get $57.98. But it's important to note here that um, with, as Jim Matthews, I believe, mentioned, uh, with outpatient uh, services, so performed in a facility setting like a hospital outpatient department, there's both a physician payment and a hospital facility payment. So in this case, this is not the true cost of the service. There's going to be two payments. Um, and th this is because the practice expense is not the same for a facility. A facility has different expenses, and so they would get a different payment. But uh, the facility payment's $96.25. So the total payment here is really $154.23. Um, so just so you understand that there's two payments going on there. The second one is not part of the fee schedule, though. Okay, and here's a, another example with a little more complicated set of RVUs. So a knee surgery, obviously this RVU is much higher because it requires more resources, so it's 18.01. Same geographic payment amount um, and same conversion factor. And this also would have a facility fee as well, which is well over $2,000. Um, and then one more contrast. Um, oops. Can I just say disconnect? Um, one more contrast, uh, same knee surgery, but done in West Virginia. Um, so you can see that the, the RVU, I mean, I'm sorry, the geographic adjustment is below 1.954. Now, however, remember I told you earlier that there's a gypsy floor. <laughs> so that, that, that would actually apply in this case. This would actually be multiplied by one, not by 0.954. But I just wanted you to see sort of the difference in, in geography. The, the gypsy floor sort of suppresses that at this point. And that actually is only in effect as long as, long as the SGR sort of override is in effect. So that expires also on April 1, that floor. Um, OK, so I'm going to move on. There are other adjustments to the fee schedule, and I'm going to talk about several of them. But um, the first set would be just sort of differences between physicians that participate in the Medicare program versus those that don't. Um, and those that participate agree to accept Medicare's payment in full. So that 80% paid by Medicare and the 20% paid by the beneficiary of their supplemental insurance, that's their payment. Non-participating physicians, and there are some, are paid 95% of the fee schedule. So they're paid less, but they're allowed to balance bill for a limited amount above the fee schedule amount. Um, and there's not very many of them, which I'll get to later, but uh, people do choose to do this. Um, and then we have non-physician providers, so that's going to be your nurse practitioners, your physician assistants. Um, they're generally paid 85% of the fee schedule amount, and they are not permitted to balance bill. Um, let's see. The next set of sort of adjustments. Again, these are multiplicative, so they're added on to the payment. So you've got your payment amount, and then you're adding this on. Um, there's two bonus programs that are designed to encourage um, the supply, to increase the supply of certain um, physicians in certain areas, so especially primary care. But um, Medicare pays a bonus for um, providing services in what's called a shortage area. Um, they also provide a bonus for surgical services in some of these shortage areas. And then there's also a, a new bonus, I believe, that came in with ACA that um, provides another bonus uh, on top of their payments um, for practicing in certain um, primary care specialties. And again, this is going to be paid to them quarterly, so it's added on to all their payments as a 10% of whatever their payments were, for example, for each of these. Okay, and then this is a busy slide, so we're not going to read all this, but basically there's four incentive programs that have been in effect, and they're kind of important for some of our discussion later on, but there's the physician quality reporting system, um, the electronic health record program, the e-prescribing e program, as well as the value-based modifier. Now, all of these have both, the difference with these are they have both a bonus and a penalty phase. So this is a, 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 a kind of gets at what Jim was saying, using payment policy to sort of encourage certain behaviors. Um, and all, almost all of these, I believe, now are in their um, starting their penalty phase, um, with the exception of the value-based modifier. That's fairly new. Um, but most people, if they don't provide um, evidence that they've <laughs> Uh, are, are reporting satisfactorily on their quality metrics, for example, and I won't get into what that means because there's some specific definitions, or if they aren't, aren't using elect electronic health records in a meaningful way, um, they, they, they face penalties. Um, most of these are re relatively small, starting at 1% or 2%, but when you start, start, start to start thinking of all the stuff that's going on, it's, it's a lot to keep track of for a physician's office and um, for a practice. Um, 
But I will say that some of these penalties are not very big and they are things that could be made up on volume. They're not, it's not something that physicians couldn't make up if they really wanted to. But anyway, we have some reports on, um, I'm no expert on EHR or ERX, but GEO has done some work in this area and I encourage you to take a look. Um, okay, so now we're gonna get to why we have physician spending targets. But before I do that, does anybody have questions about how the payment system works or the kind of different components or was any of that, did I go through it too fast? <laughs> okay. Um, right now I'm reading this book about cheese and um, the author did something that I was hoping to do today, but I'm not able to do it. Um, uh, he wanted to make it more enticing for those people reading it. So he says it's about love, betrayal, and ver of revenge. And I was hoping I'd have this like really salacious story to tell you guys about SGR. <laughs> but I don't, I don't. Um, I will say though that it is a cautionary tale of um, how overriding payment policy can really create a big mess for a lot of folks. And we're kind of gonna get into some of that. But I guess if you take one thing away besides kind of how this all works, um, to the extent possible, I hope, you know, as you're working on the Hill, that you're able to make policy that everybody can live with. Because <laughs> this is not a policy people have been able to live with. So why do we have this thing? It doesn't work and people don't like it. Um, let's talk about that. So um, from the 80s through the 90s, um, be, we saw a lot of um, spending growth uh, for physician services. And in part because, as Jim mentioned, it, a lot of these payment systems were based on just what people wanted to charge, what their traditional, customary, usual charges were, and there was really no sort of logical organization to it. Um, and a lot of this spending growth comes from what we call the volume uh, or number of services and the intensity or complexity of the services. So um, just to give you an example of what we mean by volume, well, uh, or, or intensity is probably the better one to talk about, but an, an x-ray is of a certain kind of intensity and an MRI scan is of a different kind, right? It's a much higher intensity, it requires more resources, it costs more. Um, so that's what we mean by in increases in intensity. Um, and so Congress created SGR in the predecessor system, which was called the Medicare Volume Performance Standard, not a good acronym relative to Gypsy, um, <laughs> which led to very volatile updates. Um, and SGR was put in place as an attempt to bring stability um, about by creating a more statutorily set formula. Um, so when the fee schedule was being debated, um, the Secretary of HHS basically um, refused to put an, an RBRVS system in place without some kind of spending target because they knew um, if there's no cap on payments or no sort of break on them, that volume would just grow and um, as Jim mentioned, the fee schedule just encourages more and more just on its own. There's nothing to sort of break, cause any stop. You can just keep, in, keep doing more services and more and more and that's what you get under, under a fee schedule like the physician fee schedule. So this is kind of trying to give a historical picture of what's happened with volume and intensity um, over this time period that we've had um, SGR as well as pr prior to the fee schedule. Um, and I'll just say, you can see like, if you look at the, the 1980s to the early 1990s, it looks like, and then you compare that to the next period, which is the fee schedule and the first performance target, it looks like that actually matters. Um, and so for a long time, I think a lot of us felt like, you know, this thing's not bad. It's actually doing what we hope it would do, which is put the brakes on spending. Um, and I, I'm not talking about access or quality of care here. I'm just sort of saying putting the brakes on spending, using it to kind of slow this trend. But then you start to see um, kind of in the 2000s, it's a little less certain that, um, that that's what's going on here. There's probably some other things. I would say though that it's definitely, you know, less volume and intensity than it otherwise would have been. Now, if you look at 2013, it's a little odd because it's a negative number and we've had a couple of those, but um, some people might want to just jump to the conclusion that it's the economy. <laughs> That's not exactly what's going on. I actually spoke to the actuary the other day and um, he told me that uh, if you use more complete data, which these things are done based on estimates and the best data they have at the time they do this work, um, that it's no longer negative, but still much slower growth. So I'm guessing it's probably closer to the 1.4 um, number, but we'll, we will see when we have more numbers coming out in the spring. Um, so this is why we had SGR and, and the Medicare Volume Performance Standard was to, to, to sort of put some brakes on what was going on in the 1980s. Okay, so in theory, I'm going to talk a little bit about how SGR is supposed to work and how, it, how it's calculated. Um, so it accounts for the factors that you would expect um, to affect spending growth, the increase in the prices of the services, um, the input prices, um, fee-for-service enrollment changes, as well as spending because of laws and regulations. So if Congress puts something in place, 
like they're going to say, okay, now we're going to give a preventative exam to all new Medicare beneficiaries. Well, that's going to increase services because that wasn't in place before. So that's kind of what we're talking about there. Um, and typically the changes in spending due to laws and regulations are relatively small um, changes affecting the SGR, but um, the SGR override itself is also a change in law and regulation is calculated into this. So that makes it very complicated. Um, so SGR also allows spending to grow with the economy, which at the time this was determined, it was GDP per capita, real GDP per capita. Um, the previous, uh, the predecessor system did not include this allowance. Um, and Congress did debate whether or not it should be GDP or GDP plus one or GDP plus two, which you'll hear a lot when people are trying to think of factors to increase things by. Um, but at the time, and the reason why they thought about that was because they knew medical inflation was much higher than what was going on in the economy. But at the time it was decided this is what we can afford. Whatever the CBO score was, that probably told them where they were going to go with this in terms of whether it should be GDP or GDP plus one. Okay, this is the kind of more complicated, nuanced part of it, which it doesn't work like this. So it's kind of like, oh, I'm going to teach you something that's uh, kind of useful. <laughs> so there is this thing called the Medicare Economic Index. And actually, it is a good measure of, um, you know, increase in practice of inflation for physicians. Um, although some might argue with that point, they might say it could be better. But it, it serves as the baseline. Um, and then you adjust MEI based on how um, the cumulative spending that's gone on relates to a cumulative target. Um, if the cumulative spending is equal to the target, then the update's equal to MEI. Now, that's never happened. Um, but if it's not equal, then there's an update adjustment factor, another piece of math that's used to increase or decrease the fee update relative to MEI. Um, and to keep it stable, uh, they put in place a constraint on the update adjustment factor. It can only be three percentage points above or seven percentage points below MEI. And MEI historically has trended at about 2%. So you can just figure that out. It's either a 5% positive update is probably the biggest one you're going to see and um, a negative 5% update is the, the smallest one you're going to see. Except for, <laughs> in reality, that's not what's been going on. Um, okay, this is just sort of a depiction of this. I don't think we need to talk about it, but you can see sort of the spending compared to the targets above MEI. The update compared to MEI is below. If it's equal, it's equal. If it's below, it's above. All right, this is another piece of sort of like artifact of the system that in the past when I presented this slide, it's been a lot different because we're looking at real deficits and now we're looking at sort of, um, it's not fake money, but it's just hard to really track. Um, <clears throat> each March, um, the actuaries at CMS have to estimate the physician update for the following calendar year using the best data they have on all those factors I mentioned, the number of enrollees, um, MEI, um, and uh, GDP. And so this is always subject to change and they update these over the, through the course of a year. Um, but if you look at this, you can compare the actual spending to the allowed spending, and then you get the, the final column, which is the $3.6 billion. So over 19, from 1996 to 2014, it looks like we're doing quite well, actually. We're, we're now in positive territory. Actual, um, compared to allowed, we're a little below, which is a good thing. Same thing when you just look at the single year of 2014. However, <laughs> um, Usually, I would say, look at this last column, and it's, it, you can think of it as the debt that's owed, but there's no debt owed according to this. Uh, and some think that this is an effect of the economy, but I talked to the actuary about this a little bit, and um, the method of legislative override, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, that's, that we're currently using and have been using for a while, has created this artificial alignment of actual spending with the targets. Now, he could explain this in much more detail to all of you, and I don't know how many of you have ever talked to actuaries. They're, they're fun to talk to. But um, you might feel sorry for him because he has to do this over and over again. Every year he has to calculate this thing, put out a document, and it's kind of like this is not really what's going on. Um, it, it's sort of... But actuaries, you know, they, they can assume just like economists, so it's not too bad. Um, I do have his contact information at the end of my presentation, so if you want to sort of get more detail and understanding on this, um, you can get in touch. Um, I will say the other, th the other piece of this is, I mean, because I asked him about the economy, he said, well, lower spending is, a lower physician spending affected the, the, low, the slower economy affected lower physician spending. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, the, slow in the, slow, the slow growth in the economy and healthcare spending overall did affect the actual spending. But GDP is part of the target, and so the economy affected the allowed spending. Um, so those effects really cancel each other out, which is why this looks positive, even though if they were really calculating the debt, it probably would not look like this. All right, now we're going to talk about SGR in practice. And I would say SGR is basically like the ultimate 
can kicking exercise unfortunately um, we hear about that a lot but this is one where we've been doing this for a long time now um, okay so just some trends in the updates um, so the SGR was permitted to work per statute um, from 1998 to 2002 and then ever since then Congress has overrode that requirement um, every year and sometimes more than once in a year because they haven't been able to pass one bill to cover the entire year in a few cases. Um, to try to maintain budget neutrality, they used two mechanisms. The first few years they used what was called the clawback, and the second period they used what's called the cliff, and we're going to talk a little bit more about those, although I'm not going to explain all of it. The clawback basically, just sort of the, the basics of the SGR because we're talking about a 10-year budget window, um, the clawback allowed you to kind of override what was required by SGR, but you were still able to recoup the money with the associated additional spending within that 10-year budget window, and so hence the, the, the clawback. That only worked for a very short period of time. Um, eventually, they couldn't even recoup that within a, a nine years of negative, even with nine years of negative 5% updates, um, you could not recoup what was the debt that was owed. So it, it's a very sensitive <laughs> um, sort of calculation uh, as far as the SGR goes. Um, and so they came up with this other idea, the cliff, which is what we see now. Remember I told you that the MEI was constrained, it can't be uh, more than three percentage points above MEI um, or seven percentage points below? Well, the cliff mechanism basically overrides that and allows you to say, uh, make it whatever it needs to be, which, you, you know, you find that out from both CBO and CMS, 20 percent, negative 20 percent in the year, and then the year following, um, the temporary payment, I'm sorry, in the year following the temporary payment um, increase or freeze or whatever they decide to do, that's when that 20% goes into effect. So that it's not spread out over multiple years like SGR normally would do, it's all within one year. <laughs> um, and I think initially the first, claw, the, the first cliff was not that bad, it might have been like 8 or 9%. Now we've gotten into 20% territory and it's going back down a little bit, but still, that's, that's not something that anybody thinks is going to happen or should happen. Um, because we don't know what the effects would be. We do know that with small negative updates, we've seen n not much of an effect on beneficiary access and other things, and I'll get to that, but uh, we know that a 20% would probably have some pretty substantial effects. Okay, so just looking at this, this is kind of just laying out what happened. Um, you know, in the first few years, physicians were pretty happy because they were getting positive updates, and then 2002 rolled around, they got a negative update. That's the only year that um, the negative update ever occurred. And then er every year after that, you can see, um, you know, we've had really small updates and fee freezes, um, but then SGR has been calling for these really large negative updates. Um, and right now we're looking at a 21.2% decline in, on April 1. Uh, and I will say, once the first negative update went into place, you know, I believe this is, the, Folks will tell you this, they've been on the Hill, but I, the lobbying probably started pretty much then. Um, and I'm sure if people could look back, they'd say I might have taken a 5% negative update to get out of this mess. Um, and the actuaries, you know, even I was on detail to the Hill for a few years working on this particular issue um, with the Ways and Means Committee. And, um, you know, when I talked to the actuaries then, they would tell us, you know, if we just let the system work, then um, we probably would have been back in positive territory within a few years and we wouldn't be facing this situation every year. But um, I'm not sure that everybody can live with that. And, um, you know, in some ways this has worked. It's kind of peculiar, but <laughs> okay. Um, so let me give you an example. I know this one better, so I, I kind of stuck with this. But one of the reasons why SGR is so difficult is you have to pay for all these increases, at least under existing budget law and how people traditionally have been dealing with these things. Um, so for the 2013 override, CBO had estimated that it would cost $25.2 billion over 10 years. And so um, the, ta the American Taxpayer Relief Act basically um, paid for it with the number of offsets. And you can imagine the offsets have to come from um, uh, other providers as well as physicians um, because you can't get all that money just out of uh, uh, the, the physician payment system. Um, there have been 16, I just want to say one other thing here, there's been 16 bills that have been passed to override SGR, and some folks put a cost of that of being like $170 billion, so they've already spent a lot of money just doing these temporary fixes. Um, so let's take a look at the actual overrides, I mean the, over, the offsets here. 
Most of these, as you can see, don't really affect physicians. Um, they come from, you know, the, the, the health, I mean, the hospital industry, uh, which, um, you know, in this case, it was $14.7 billion um, in, for two of these, so more than half. The document, documentation and coding adjustment for inpatient hospitals was one of the pay-fors, um, as well as the rebasing of state disproportionate share hospital allotments, which Jim talked about a little bit. But those two things alone uh, made up $14.7 billion. And so we saved $26 billion to pay for the, the SGR, and I guess they had a little bit left over, if you're just trying to do the math there. Um, and I think it's true that you'll hear from the hospitals that they support and all the other providers support elimination of SGR. It has an impact on them as well, not just because of the cuts, but they really don't want to be the ones paying for it year after year. Okay, some implications, which I sort of already talked about a little bit. But beneficiary access, how has that been affected? That's one of the questions that the, the age old question associated with SGR and the physician payment system. Um, in the beginning, uh, CMS did study um, how beneficiary access was affected, and they, I think they were mandated to do reports on it, and they didn't find any, any major effects. Um, we took a look at this um, in several reports, but from 2000 to 2008, we haven't done any new work in this area. Um, we generally found that the proportion of beneficiaries receiving services increased, the number of services provided increased, um, and physicians appeared very willing to accept patients. And most of the other work, including the work MedPAC has done, they've continued to do work in this area every year. Um, as well as the consumer assessment of health plans um, and the Medicare current beneficiary survey. And I'll show you an example from that. Have, have continued to show that access has not been affected. It's generally similar to what you see in the private sector um, and stable. There have been some concerns with um, new patients trying to get primary care doctors, um, but not enough that somebody would say access is a real problem yet. Okay. And I will say the study that we did, as well as MedPAC, there was that one negative fee update as I mentioned earlier, during that period. And we actually saw pretty large growth during that time in terms of the number of services being provided and the number of beneficiaries getting those services. Okay, this is from the Medicare Current Beneficiary Survey. Um, uh, and just, as you guys might not know this, but with all Medicare data, there's a lot of a lag. There's at least a two-year lag. This is true of Medicaid data as well. Most healthcare data, it's not gonna be like 2014, here's the number. Um, you need to wait a little bit for, for some of the data to come back. But so we're seeing basically that there's pretty steady trend here, maybe a slight decline in 2012 by a percentage point. Maybe 2013 looks worse, I don't know yet. It'll be interesting to see. However, I'll just reiterate that if we, we were having major access problems, we'd be hearing from somebody. Um, you, you'd hear about it from AARP or some of the other beneficiary groups. <clears throat> and I, <clears throat> I will also say that um, uh, we've, we've never actually uh, well, the specialty societies used to come to GAO and when I was on the Hill too, and they'd always talk about what would happen to beneficiary access, but nobody's ever really kind of studied it after the fact other than these surveys we've been doing, MedPAC's been doing. But AMA will always say, like, oh, there's a, a negative update, then be beneficiary access will be affected, but we've never really had, we've never really had any information from the specialty societies on, you know, what they think would happen. It's all sort of what would happen if there was a fee cut, so. Um, it would be interesting to do that, but probably not an experiment any congressperson wants to do. <laughs> um, okay. Um, another measure of, of sort of um, the, the ability to obtain services is the participation rate and claims assignment rate. And I mentioned these a little earlier. Like, basically, if a physician's willing to take Medicare's payment in full, that's a good sign that, you know, they're willing to provide services to beneficiaries. Um, so the participation rate um, has been climbing over time, and it's now at, like, 96%. Um, and the assignment rate is pretty high. It's 99.3. I mean, there's not very many providers that are not taking assignment on claims. They might not be participating, but they're still taking it. They can take assignment on a case-by-case -case basis. A lot of them do this because of the benefits of, you know, how much um, they get paid as well as, like, timely payment for services. Okay. Um, so how is spending been affected? We kind of saw a little bit of that looking at the volume and intensity table. Um, and it's, it's basically growing... Um, on average per beneficiary by 4.4%. Um, just reading of the trustees report, which is where this information comes from, um, much of it's due to that volume and intensity I talked about, greater use of specialists, the aging of the Medicare population, and certain administrative actions, which I don't know what they mean by that, but they included it. Um, so taking a look at the actual spending, you can see that um, you know, it was growing pretty fast in the early years of, of SGR. 
And um, now we're seeing a much slower rate of growth um, and even a slight decline in 2013. But again, it's not totally the economy and not all the things you might think. Um, there has been slower price growth, um, which is the main cause. Um, and that's because of the SGR. Um, a 0% payment update even with SGR is not, you know, avoiding SGR is great, but you've still got not much growth in the payment rate. And then there's also the sequester, which is in effect in this period. Um, on April 1, there was a 2% cut for all providers in Medicare that was imposed. Um, so this slowdown might be artificial. We don't really know if this is real yet. Okay. And I like to steal slides from MedPAC every once in a while because they really do produce good material and you should read what Jim was talking about in terms of their payment basics. They have a lot of great people working there. They've been working on these issues for a number of years. Um, so this is from their December presentation, which is preliminary data, but I think is pretty solid. Um, so if you want to compare like how, how much volume makes a difference here, you can see, you know, spending per beneficiary has been growing at about 65%. It's a little slower than it was in 2012. Um, but it's still growing much more rapidly than um, either the MEI or the payment updates. Um, so this is just there to show you that volume and intensity of services really does increase spending quite a bit. Okay. Um, another sort of implication of, of SGR is that we start to see um, some of the trends in certain services growing because people are trying to make up expenditures um, however they can. Um, and imaging's changed a little bit, and Jim alluded to this, but we did some work um, back in 2000 and 2006 um, just looking at where the, the sites and service shifts were, and you can see here that um, there was a lot of growth in the imaging, and then this, a lot of that growth was going to physician offices. Um, once a provider gets equipment, there's often, you know, an incentive to actually use that equipment. Uh, but there have been some cuts in place, the DRA and other imaging-related payment policies, such as reducing payments for doing multiple images on the same day and eliminating side of service differentials, um, which has resulted in much lower growth in, in imaging. But this was an early effect and an early cause of some of the growth you were yeah. seeing in SGR and the physician-related physician spending. Um, this report led to us doing some work in self-referral, which you may also hear quite a bit about. Um, and uh, again, it's kind of the same sort of financial incentives are in place to sort of encourage um, certain types of services, growth in those services, um, because it's, it's easy to get into that line of business or it's something that you already have on hand um, or you're, you join a practice where this is a com common practice. But um, basically what we found is that um, the referrals for CT and MRI services um, increased the year after people started self-referring. So that's the switcher category you can see at the very top. I don't know how we got switchers in a report, but <laughs> it's uncommon for us. Um, but anyway, so you can see the percentage change is 67.3%, whereas the non-self-referrers, uh, the folks that were never self-referrers and the folks that had been self-referring prior to 2009, or 2000, yeah, 2009, um, they, their growth was actually declining. And this sort of proves that there's, you know, there's definitely some financial incentive going on that's driving um, a lot of these, these increases in referrals over this time period. One more MedPEC thing. Um, just to give you more of a breakout of all these different areas of growth, so imaging tests, other procedures, evaluation and management, and major procedures. So um, you can see that, yes, imaging is, is sort of declining over this time period, um, and, and uh, some of these categories are growing much more rapidly than others. So tests are growing. Tests, which remember are um, your analysis and blood cultures, they're growing around 90 percent. Um, Imaging and other procedures closer to 70%. Other procedures would be things like cataract surgeries and other outpatient surgeries, endoscopies, things like that. And the major procedures and evaluation and management, which is office visits, growing around 37%. Um, and as Jim pointed out, uh, volume growth, um, these kinds of increases translate also into Part B premium growth, which affects both taxpayers as well as beneficiaries, because as you heard earlier this morning, um, you know, that's, that's, that cost is split by both the taxpayers' general revenue, 75% of Part B comes from that, and 25% comes from, from um, the uh, uh, beneficiaries. Um, and, you know, I think what MedPAC says about this is important. It's, this is a sign that some of the services could be, you know, misvalued or, or mispriced, and so that's why some services are growing faster than others. You don't make that much on an E&M visit or a major procedure, perhaps, but you can make a lot on imaging and tests, and so you do a lot of them. 
Okay. Um, and Jim also alluded to this. I didn't know he was going to steal my thunder, but um, <laughs> I think he had to. Um, another sort of implication is uh, in, of low fee growth and SGR uncertainty is that providers might be interested in um, being purchased by a hospital. Um, if you take a look at this, um, these payments are much higher uh, for some services, the same services Jim mentioned. Um, just going back to our basic example of an office visit in DC, the fee schedule payment amount was 82.71, but the OPPS amount, when you get the two payments together, was 154.23. So, right there, you're doubling your payment just by doing it in a different setting. Um, and so, you can see the percentage increase in out OPPS, which is the outpatient prospective payment system updates, have been growing substantially, whereas SGR has been quite flat. Um, and we're doing some work in this area, actually. We're looking at trends in hospital acquisition of physician practices and how that might affect the site of service. Um, office versus outpatient, and ultimately Medicare spending. Um, so we're looking into that. You probably heard from Dr. Gaynor on this as well a little bit. He's an expert. Okay, so on balance, um, in the 1990s, the experience we were seeing with SGR in place, it was pretty hopeful. Um, and without SGR, Medicare spending definitely would have been higher. I don't think anybody would argue with that point. Um, and one thing to ask you is, I don't know how many of you are sick of hearing about SGR. I don't know how many of you have heard about it so much other than today. I don't know. But um, SGR definitely is something that has kept Medicare and the larger healthcare spending problem in full view. So it's kind of good that we have this because people have to keep talking about it, even if you're tired of hearing about it. Um, but it really doesn't affect volume and intensity, at least from what we saw it doesn't, um, in the way we would like it to. Um, and there's no incentive for individual physicians to control what, what they're doing. It's been criticized for being a blunt instrument because it punishes both the good and bad actors. And as I've said a few times now, it's been very difficult for Congress to live with and create a lot of uncertainty. So what are some of the solutions? Um, well, there's a little hope, but I'm probably going to dash that hope because I work at GAO and we'd like to tell you both sides of a story. Uh, so this is just up there because this is when I started working on this issue um, back in the early 2000s. And uh, both GAO and MedPAC were asked to produce reports on this, and we made recommendations back then, which were like basically get rid of SGR or, and replace it with something else, or modify the system. Um, and nothing happened in either of those regards. There have been a few tiny changes, but not much. So um, I want to focus now on where MedPAC is on this issue. We have not commented on it since, since that time. Um, but they came up with, this happened while I was actually on my detail, they came up with sort of a plan for how you might um, deal with this situation. Their suggestion was to, to put in statutorily specified updates um, and re make refinements to the fee schedule and then try to move physicians into alternative payment models, which Jim alluded to a little bit. And they did a commendable job of also trying to come up with a list of potential offsets within all the recommendations that they make to cover the cost of repealing and replacing SGR. And this, this is good because it tried to reform the fee-for-service system. It encouraged the alternative payment models. and. Some people don't like this part, which is their specialty differential. So you're paying more for primary care. You're cutting their, their um, payments a little differently than you're cutting all the other specialists. Some people don't like that, especially when you talk to like a group like the AMA because you're pitting one specialty against another. Um, so again, you can see 110th they tried, 111th they tried, 112th, that's the one I was in, they tried, um, 113th they tried, we have a bill. I'm hoping with the 114th that that's a lucky number somehow and that you guys are going to like fix this, right? I mean, I, I, I keep hoping I'm not coming back in 2017, but who knows. Um, so you probably heard about the tri-committee bill, um, and this is just kind of a high level. I encourage you just to, there's legislative language and, um, and there's summaries um, put together by the, the, the three committees of jurisdiction, Ways and Means, Energy and Commerce, and um, Senate Finance. Again, this was done on a bicameral, bipartisan basis. Um, and they basically have some elements that are similar to some of the previous provisions, which is on my next slide. Um, but uh, it did take a lot of time for people to get to this point. I mean, when I was up there, we were talking about some of these things and meeting with groups and trying to figure all this out. And, um, you know, it, it's a lot of work to, to try to get to something like this um, and to get to something that people can, again, live with. Uh, but I'll just talk about kind of all of them, basically all the different proposals that have been out there. Uh, and one thing I wanted to say, let me just go back. One thing I wanted to say about the, the tri-committee bill um, is it does try to harmonize all the different uh, penalty and bonus programs we mentioned earlier. So there's a lot of those going on. So there's not all the separate additional programs, but it tries to get all that together and deal with that as well, which is not really on the slide, but um, it's important to note. Okay. 
So among the, the previous reform proposals, uh, most of them what they do is they provide some kind of set update and statute for a transition period so physicians can get used to maybe moving to something else or doing something different. They try to include incentives to get away from fee-for-service. Um, they encourage new um, payment and care delivery models and they incorporate performance on cost and quality. That's pretty much what most of them do. Um, and so, you know, this is, as I said, this has been a long time coming, seven years. If you look at this slide, you've got seven years of different um, proposals and um, bills that, that try to get to this point. So, um, is change on the horizon? Well, as I said, I do hope to see a new Congress convene and not get a request to explain SGR again, but I'll come back if I have to. <laughs> um, uh, and I enjoy discussing the reasons behind this, but I do hope that the expertise on this particular topic at some point does become obsolete. It would be, probably be a good thing. Um, and unfortunately, as I was updating this presentation, we got news that things might be even less hopeful than they were just a few weeks ago, if you saw some of the news yesterday. But let's just kind of talk about why we were hopeful that change was going to happen, even with the tri-committee bill. Um, it's mostly been an obstacle to pay for, for SGR, as I mentioned before, and we'll talk about, it, about those scores over time. Um, it's been difficult to kind of get rid of fee-for-service. Lots of people do like it, because um, they kind of can predict what they're going to be paid very easily. Um, and as I said, people don't, can't, haven't been able to live with what we have. So what's been different is that there was a lower CBO score. Um, the committees of jurisdiction worked together. The specialty society supported this, and that legislation did pass the House. But when you look at the CBO estimates of just simple SGR fixes, um, you can see the score is back on the rise for this whole thing. Um, just in the very first year, it looks like it's really cheap, which is kind of an effect of the using that cliff mechanism. Um, it looks like, okay, if we just got rid of it and did a fee freeze for 10 years, which people probably wouldn't have liked, but they would have been able to fight another day on that particular topic, um, it would have only cost us $48.6 billion, which would have been nice. Um, but cliff financing really made that go away very quickly. If you just look at 2007, the first year we were doing cliffs, it was already up to $177 billion. And then um, in November 2012, um, you can see it's 243.7. Um, and then it dropped by, you know, $100 billion. And you're like, how did that happen? Well, you know, if you haven't experienced the vagaries of CBO scoring yet, you will. Um, and basically, there was a slowdown in, the, in overall healthcare spending, which many of you probably heard about. It takes CBO a little bit of time to incorporate those kind of trends. It needs to happen like three years in a row for them to really seriously consider it. So. From November, you know, we were, that's our third year of the, this slow growth in uh, healthcare spending. By February, they say, okay, yes, we see it's real. So we don't think the spending is going to be as high by going to this fee freeze. Um, but, it, in, you know, back then I was joking that, hey, it's on sale. Um, it's not still, it's still on sale, but it's not like a fire sale like it was. Now it's back up to 137. Um, and this has also to do with the tri committee bill. Um, the tri-committee bill, the cost was um, 144 in November, and it was already ticking up, and now it's 174.4, so that's not good news. Um, as I said, the, the tri-committee bill, unfortunately, doesn't have all the pay-fors. Um, there have been some attempts at pay-fors. When it passed the House, it did use a temporary delay of um, the individual mandate penalties to pay for it. Um, and so ACA sort of changes are one way that folks have thought about paying for this. Um, another way they thought about it is um, using the Overseas Contingency Operations Fund, you probably heard about that, OCO, um, which was put in place for the operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, that's been another favor that people have wanted to tap into. At one point, it didn't exist any longer, <laughs> but I think it's, it's back because now we're dealing with um, more threats overseas with ISIS and ISIL or whatever you want to call them. Um, but some people don't like that because it's a budget gimmick. It's basically taking money that's sort of not real and wasn't going to be spent anyway to pay for something that isn't happening. So they, some people like it. They think that's fine. Some people don't. Um, and then there's another idea. Just don't pay for it. Just get rid of it and don't pay for it. I think there's a lot of folks that are not comfortable with that idea at the moment, but you never know. Um, I'm not sure if the special interests and in, uh, the special interests in the specialty society still like the tri-committee bill. I don't know if they got another crack at it. If they would say, "Yes, um, we like it," um, and we don't really know what the legislative priorities are yet for for this Congress. Um, not completely, I guess. And the 2016 election could come into play as well. Um, and 
Hospitals might not support it if it means more cuts for them. So it kind of depends on how the pay-fors go. So the takeaways. Um, under the fee schedule and whatever we have in place, there's no reason to think that volume intensity growth will remain below real GDP. Even if we're seeing a slowdown right now, I, I don't think it's a long-term sort of um, uh, premise that will that will stay true. Um, beneficiary access has not been affected so far, but they've basically overridden the cuts every year. Um, you know, we need to look at fee stability, spending, and budgetary issues in, ter in determining what should come come in its place, and what we're going to need to look outside of Part B spending to achieve savings. Um, and as Jim mentioned earlier, I mean, you get what you pay for. I mean, payment policy is a very powerful tool, um, and if you want to have better outcomes and better quality, you have to pay for that. That's what you want. That's what you have to reward. And fee-for-service does not do that as it stands right now. Um, it seems like, you know, paying a different way is the way to go. That's how Jim kind of concluded some of what he was talking about. The tri-committee bill does encourage new payment models. The president's budget seems to agree. Um, and as you probably heard in the news recently, HHS is trying to set a goal of tying 30 percent of traditional or fee-for-service Medicare payments, the whole system, not just physicians, um, to quality and value through alternative payment models, and they're trying to do that by 2016, which might be kind of ambitious, I don't know. Um, but uh, they're also trying to get it to 50 percent by 2018, I believe. So, you know, they want to increase the value of the payments. Uh, so I told you I would give, instead of giving you my name, which you can have, but uh, I decided to give you Kent Clemens because he is really truly the expert. He's the person that I said has to calculate this every year over and over again. Um, he's very nice to talk to, but you do have to ask really specific questions with actuaries. I hope none of you are actuaries, but you do have to ask. You have to know what you want to hear back from them. But um, he's really helpful in terms of figuring this out and how it works and explaining to you, like, even if you see something and your boss thinks, okay, that must mean the economy is helping with SGR, you may want to check with Kent because it might not really be what's going on. And with that, 